Amen. There are five of you. Come on right now. In Jesus' name, if you were, hey, Brother Jason Dillon spoke to you, come on up right now. Hey, Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. Come on. Let's give God some praise right now. Woo! Thank him for what he's doing. I said thank him for what he's doing. Anybody going to thank God for what he's doing right now? Hallelujah. Well, in Jesus' name, praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen, amen. Well, I want to announce to you this is the last year we'll be here. We're fixing to move into a 1,200-seat auditorium. Amen. By Easter Sunday this next year. And our plans are to expand the apostolic conference and to make it bigger. Hallelujah. Woo! Come on, somebody ought to shout and thank God for that. I, I think Brother Wright figured it up. If we seat you like we do here, we can seat almost 1,700 people in there if we seat it like this here. And uh, we, that's not counting the platform, so... Amen. We're getting ready for God to do a great and mighty work in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. But I just want to just let you know what the Lord's been doing here, that these some of these folks have come. Amen. They were here last year, and they went home, and they're just going to tell you about what the Lord has done. Amen. In revival, where they are. Tell us where you're from. Amen. What the Lord's doing. Praise God. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. I got two minutes to tell you, at least, at least two minutes to tell you about what God has done. I thank the Lord for, for, the, for this United Pentecostal Church that allowed us to be involved in such a great conference. To even, to even be numbered among them that are sanctified is already something to shout about. But in order to, in order to meet people like this, this man and his family and this church family, to be involved in that just blows my mind. I don't, I don't, I can't even get it all. But last year we came to this conference not knowing what to expect. Uh, uh, we drove, we drove down, and when we pull up on the parking lot, I don't have time to tell you, but miracles begin to happen for us just like that. I mean, the minute we, the minute we pulled up on the parking lot, and the, and the message was about a sin. It was a sin, and it's and 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 that's what we were going through. We were trying to be. When you're trying to build, you're always trying to go higher. I don't know about you. If you're not trying to go higher, you in the you in the wrong business. But we're trying to go higher, and so the message was a sin. And and if I tell you that that thing got down in our spirit, I mean, I mean, I I could just see myself going back to my city, and everywhere I went, I saw myself. You know, I I claim it as a summit, and I took my flag and I put my flag down. Glory to God. I said, why are we going higher? This city is for us. This is ours, you know. And even, and even coming to this conference this year, I've been, you know, I've been teaching our church about building. I didn't know that, that's, that, that this was the theme, but we've been talking about building. And I said, you know what? The Lord has so much, you know, for us when you're building a church, when you're trying to start a church from the ground up, there are things that God speaks to you that he don't speak to an established church. Because they don't need to hear some of the stuff that we need to hear. And God began to speak to us, and he began to tell us, you know, tell me different things about building. You understand? Know about, about when you're building a house, there's things that, that you know, that the roofer don't hear. That's, 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 that, that's stuff that happens when you're doing the dirt work that the painter don't know nothing about. Glory to God. So, so, I, so you know what? We begin to build, and, and we are building. Then you, I get here, and this man say, you and I. Take you and I out. You can't build nothing without you and I. Glory to God. You know, so this conference, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you, this thing is, uh, is line upon line, precept upon precept. I mean, it is what God has ordered. I got a word today. I got a word today. You understand? I just believe God. I just believe God. I tell you, I just believe God. I don't know about you, but I believe God. I believe he's able to do just what he said he's going to do. I believe he's able to make the devil back up. Glory to God. I believe God that I'm ready to take my city. I'm not telling you. I'm not just blowing wind. I'm telling you what I believe God for. I'm looking for the dead to be raised, eyes to be open, ears to be unstopped. I'm looking for it. Yes, I'm going to the funeral home. Why? Because I'm going to say, hey, if you got somebody that don't have a pastor here, I so pay attention. God is speaking in this service. God is speaking in this house. 
Put your hands together and thank God what the Lord's doing. Hey, come on, praise God. Hallelujah. Tell him where you're from. Praise the Lord, Dallas Brock, my sweet wife, Roxy, from Portland, Oregon. Th Amen. 330,000 people within a five-mile radius. We came here last year praying for six months and couldn't get a, a place anywhere. Where we were, we were at capacity. We needed a miracle. We left here in two weeks after we got back. God opened the door. A church opened their arms. A $4 million building. We have full access. Commercial kitchen, playground for the kids. Everything we prayed for. Amen. That's a miracle. Amen. And Brother Shatwell has this prayer out here. Pray this prayer because that's what did it. Amen. We got back the very first service. There was four healings because of this prayer right here. Bind and loose. We're not a, a flesh and, and blood organization. Amen. And one more thing I want to tell you and I'm done. We want to make a difference in our community. And we began to pray this prayer when we got back. And the Lord put a, an exotic dance club that was a block and a half from our church. Pray against that place, he said. I had no idea what it was about. But I told my, God said, you need to tell your church the name. Step out in faith. I said, well, that's kind of crazy, Lord. But I did it. Three months later, a man in our church said, Pastor, you need to check out the news. Something's going on at Stars." An FBI investigation, they said, that began three months ago. One week after we started praying. They rescued two girls that were being fed meth and prostituted. Two girls were rescued out of that situation. And were given counseling. And I don't know where they are today, but I know our prayers did made a difference. Amen. You're going back home, home missionaries, and expect miracles. Expect miracles. I'm nothing special, but I serve a God who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can ask or think. It doesn't matter if it's the West Coast or the East Coast or the Bible Belt. My God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Come on, put your hands together and give God some praise right now. Hallelujah. Hey, come on, praise God. Jerry, come on up. I'm Brother Parrott. This is my wife, Sherry. We're from Platte City, Missouri. And I'm going to tell you, how many of you have heard the expression, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. These men and their family and this congregation changed that for me. I got a letter in the mail, and the letter said, we want to bring you to Madison at our cost. And I said, trash. I said, nothing's free. And a lady that was, moved, that was going to do a, whole, or a church uh, in a day in Iowa from Arkansas, she went up and she stayed with us, her and her husband. And I told her about that. I said, I got this thing in the mail. And I said, what a joke, free. <laughs> nothing's free. And she said, you have to go to that. I'm going to tell you right now. As long as this is going on, I may not come for free, but I will be here because what happens in this place sparks a fire deep down inside. Last year, last year on this night, Brother Stone King preached, you got to make it happen. And we left here on fire. And we went home and we prayed for people and watched it. Hey, how many of you have a problem praying somebody through the Holy Ghost? Make it happen. Walk up and speak it. Look him in the eye and say, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to put my hands on you. You're going to speak in tongues. I did that. She spoke in tongues. And I was like, this is incredible. These men have faith. These men have faith. And I appreciate. And I'm going to, I'm going to step aside in just one second. I know I'm, I know I'm old. I'm 50 years old this year. I'm old. But when I grow up, I want to be like this man. And I want to produce fruit like he's produced here. Because I know God is in this. Amen. Praise God. Come on, put your hands together and give God some praise right now. Woo! Hallelujah. Praise.
Anthony Melissa Inns from Vancouver, British Columbia. This is our second year, and we are incredibly blessed to be here. I got two things to confess at the beginning. The first is I don't understand everything that goes on in the spiritual realm, and I'm completely new at all of that, and uh, still trying to figure my way through it. But last year, so this is the first thing, last year, uh, I remember towards the end of the conference, uh, Brother Wright had his uh, daughter-in-law and, and son come up here and uh, begin to pray. And I kind of sat down there. They described what was getting ready to happen. And I, I stood there, and I'm a fairly analytical guy. I, I go after it. I worship and pray and all that. But I also trying to figure things out. And I stood there while everybody was worshiping for a second. And uh, before I tell you what happened, the, the second part was... That when we went to the city of Vancouver, everybody told us we were going right downtown. They said, you're over your head. You're never going to be able to reach those people down there. It's a completely different area. It breaks, the devil breaks apart families. Marriages disintegrate. Uh, you're never going to be able to bring anything out of there. Try a suburb, suburb somewhere out of there. And I felt, I think I might have mentioned last, week, last year, but I felt strongly that God was wanting us to go for the gates of the city. That's all I could get in my, mi in my mind was the gates of the city. So we went downtown. Well, I, the second thing I'm going to confess is that I knew I was overmatched going in if I went in my own strength. I ain't not the most talented guy. I don't got the most ability. I can't preach like a lot of guys. I don't have all the spiritual knowledge that other guys have. But I knew that God had called me to that city like some of you. You might not be able to explain why you're there, but you know that God called you to that city. And that's all I went armed with was a calling. And so as I stood there in the altar last year, and I began to listen to the praise and worship going on. And, and Brother Wright's uh, daughter-in-law began to pray. And they're talking about angels. We're getting ready to be released. I kind of thought, hmm, that's interesting. We'll see what happens when we get back. But before we left, while I was still standing in the altar, it was like you said, a Mack truck. Something about a Mack truck today. It was like a Mack truck had just driven by. And the wind, it was a literal wind, blew the little bit of hair I got. I could still feel it like somebody was rushing by me. And when we went home, we're talking about being, we're still connected to the Old Testament church and to the New Testament church. And when we went home, God began to open doors to old things, to the, to the Persian community. And God began to open doors and we baptized and seen Persians filled with the Holy Ghost. And we hadn't seen anybody receive the Holy Ghost. We'd only been three months into the plant at that point. But as soon as we got back, within two weeks, we baptized a Lao girl. We baptized a Jewish girl. We had some filled with the Holy Ghost. We had an Indian lady filled with the Holy Ghost. We had a couple of Persians get baptized in Jesus' name. Now we just had another Persian get the Holy Ghost. I come to sit down somebody. You don't need to be worried about the gates because it ain't you going to be bringing them down anyway. But when those gates come down, this is just the beginning. You're sensing uh, what's getting ready to happen. It's a spiritual thing, yes, but you get to experience it in the flesh. I get to watch what God is doing. It ain't me. It ain't my pretty work. It's the power of the Almighty God that is going before you to tear down strongholds and open up the kingdom in Jesus. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Woo! Hallelujah! Your pastor's already called me and told me, he said, my God, man, so this guy came, amen, you're in, in Gramercy, Louisiana, just started from nothing, just went in there, was here last year, got set on fire and hear what the Lord's doing. Praise our God. Amen. My name is Dwayne. This is my wife, Stephanie. We went to Gramercy two years and one month ago. God's allowed us. We now have over 100 people coming to our church. God gave us, we have purchased a building that we completely remodeled. And this last year, God gave us another building right next door. A man in our church his wife got sick, got in a coma, went on life support, had a breathing machine. I went in there to pray because the doctor had wanted them to come up with an end-of-life plan for her. And I prayed for her around the bed, and the Lord spoke to me and said, if you'll confess this to the family, I'll raise her up, and she'll walk out of this hospital in three days. That was on Sunday. On that night, her, her, she started producing urine. They undid her kidney dialysis. The next day, her blood pressure came up. That night, no infection in her body. Wednesday morning, she came out of her coma. Wednesday at 4 o'clock, she walked out of the hospital discharged. Praise our God. Hallelujah. 
Her husband saw that we had ran out of space and he, he evicted the tenant from his building that was two doors down and gave us the building to have, to have it as our fellowship area. Tuesday, a man in our church came to me and said, Pastor, there's a man that's sick in our church that has, or that's a friend of mine that I work with that's sick that has stage four lung cancer and he's dying. His name was Andre. I went to the trailer with my friend that goes to our church and Andre was on oxygen. He was my size. He weighed about 270 pounds, but he was at about 140. And he was at the end of his road and I began to talk to him. I said, Andre, when's the last time you've been to church? He said, Pastor, I don't even remember. And I began to talk to him about faith and try to transmit some faith. And whenever I saw that spark of life begin to come into his eyes, I went over and I laid hands on him and I started praying for him. And it was like a jolt of the Holy Ghost hit me. And I stopped praying and just started listening. And the Lord said, if you'll confess this to him, I will heal his cancer completely. So I said, Andre, you're healed right now. God has healed your cancer. I said, when do you go to the doctor? He said, I go to the doctor on Tuesday, which was two days ago. And I said, okay, I want you to do me a favor. I want to take a picture of you because I want people to see what you look like before God got a hold of you. So I took a picture of him with my phone. Tuesday after the orientation, my phone started vibrating in my pocket. I pulled it out, and it was my friend RJ that had, that had worked with him, and he was hyperventilating. He was crying so hard on the other end of the phone. He said, I talked to Andre. He went to the hospital, and they said there was no cancer in his body, and they said that they were going to stop the chemotherapy. Today, I talked to Andre and I talked to RJ and he said he went over to his house and he was raking the yard and he didn't even have his oxygen on his face. Praise our God. Nothing can stop God. Somebody ought to shout right now and thank the Lord God. Hallelujah. Come on, give God some praise and thank him right now. Praise the Lord, everybody. My name is Brother Jerry. This is my wife, Ruby Menchaca. We're from Santa Barbara, California. I appreciate what Apostolic Conference has done in our lives and coming here and being amongst our people. Last year when we came here, we took a step of faith just one year before that and moved to Santa Barbara. And you got to understand the significance of the, how much it costs to live in Santa Barbara. We, we took the step of faith because we believe God called us to that area. We believe and we stepped out. Little did we know, but the next 30 to 45 days we would be homeless. Little did we know that, that, that we would be sleeping in alleys and sleeping in empty tool sheds. But we determined within our heart and within our soul that we were going to do something for the kingdom of God. I said we were determined to do something for the kingdom of God. When... When we, got the, when we got the information about Apostolic Conference, we came here and we were hurting. We needed, we needed a spiritual awakening. And church, you've got to understand where I come from. I come from a big church scenario. Bishop, you know that. You know where I come, Brother Morgan. I know what it is to see 100 a, a people receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in one night. But when it's you and your wife, and when you're out there facing the... The, what the world is trying to do to stop what, what God has put into your heart. When we came here, Bishop, we came here, we were so blessed because of the kindness of you and your family and the church body because we know what it is to put something like this together. When it came time to offering, we just about emptied out what we had and gave because we know we were taught by my pastor that, that if you give and you give into what is going on, and let me tell you something. What the United Pentecostal Church International needs to do is reinvest in what God is doing here amongst the people of God and make this a conference a priority if you're going to be into home missions and church. But this needs to be a priority. Hallelujah. Elder, since then, we have not heard it for money. Since then, we've come here. We live in a two-bedroom house in the city of Santa Barbara, California. We have, a, we, have, we have a yard. We have a place that we get to barbecue every Monday night, a place that we can do Bible studies. Yes, I said barbecue. Got to have a barbecue where I'm from. And I'm telling you, it was because of Apostolic Conference that reawaken something deep down inside of me that put a faith. I'm trying to tell you, church, if you believe in what God is doing, put your wallet on the table. I said, put your wallet on the table and try God.
Pastor Philip Ritter from Noonan, Georgia. My beautiful wife, Rachel, is over here. Last year we came and the ministers ministered about the Lord going to bust doors wide open when we went back. We started four years ago in the living room of our home. We moved to a hotel uh, conference room. We moved to a 2,400 square foot lease facility. And from there, last year after we went back, the Lord opened up a door. There was a facility that a church was in, the pastor left, of another denomination. And we were one day from signing another two-year lease on the property. And we failed to have the meeting that night. And a man called me and said, Pastor, you didn't sign the lease yet, did you? And I said, no, we're going tomorrow. He said, I might have found a place. We went to the bank to get the keys, and the bank didn't even have the keys yet to the property. We met the banker, and the banker gave us the keys. We had the keys for seven weeks and hadn't signed a paper. That don't happen. I said, sir, we need to know what, what you're doing here. We found out the people owed $400,000. It was a three-acre property with a 3,000-square-foot sanctuary and a 2,400-separate-square-foot fellowship hall. We got the thing for a third of the cost. There's a railroad track at the end of our property. And every time the train goes by, every car is backed up right in front of our church and has to look at our church while the train goes by. The Lord knows where to put you. We're just average people serving an above average God. Amen. Hi, hallelujah. Come on, let's rejoice in the Lord and give God praise right now. Woo, hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Oh, shout to the Lord God of heaven right now. Hallelujah. Woo. My, 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 my. You be seated. I'll tell you. Come on. Praise God. Let's clap and magnify the Lord. Well, I started doing my Lee Stone King impersonation, but it would be a visual you'd never forget. And uh, I try to stay off of YouTube as much as I can. <laughs> Amen. So, Brother Stone King, if you're watching, you be you and I'll be me. And, and uh, we thank the Lord for that. Amen. Praise God. I know some of you are ready to leave, but if you'll hang on, I think the Lord's going to do something here tonight. Amen. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6. I um, appreciate Brother and Sister Dillon in this church. I really do. Appreciate their vision and their burden desire to help North America have revival. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 12, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Everybody say patience. Now see, you want to talk about faith, but you don't want to talk about patience. But you can only obtain the promise through f faith and patience. Inherit the promises for when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Saying, surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater. An oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to shew unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation 
See, that's what you need here tonight. We have fled for refuge to lay upon the hope set before us. I'm going to preach tonight on God cannot lie. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> I boarded a plane a few years ago. I was really tired. Thank God for upgrades. <laughs> Trust me, when you're in my size, you thank God for upgrades. Amen. <laughs> Please don't ask me to fly Southwest Airlines. That's not going to happen. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I was just sat down, and a lady sat next to me. Instantly, I thought, oh, great. It's going to be a long flight. Because, I mean, she was just barking orders to the flight attendants. I need this, and I need this, and I want my water just in two cubes. I mean, it was just, and I was like, great. I was ready to settle in for a long winter nap. And and I started thinking, great, I'm probably sitting next to Satan's sister here. (laughs) She's definitely already getting on my nerves. I know all y'all got the Holy Ghost and you love everybody and <laughs> I'm just telling you this how it happened. So so we we <laughs> God don't lie, but some of them out there they lying right now acting like <laughs> So anyway, so we got into the flight and we barely got into the flight. And uh, she introduces herself. I am Dr. So-and-so. And and, uh, I'm professor of Old Testament studies. I am a Jew by birth. And I specialize in covenants. I said, really? Really? Mm-hmm. I said, what do you mean by covenants? <laughs> I didn't have to play dumb. <laughs> so she launches into, it was, she's very passionate. Now just trust me, she's very passionate about her field of study. And uh, she gets into talking about the Old Testament and these covenants and the, the, the names of God, what all they symbolized. And, of course, then she talked about how they weren't allowed to say and they took the vows out and the tetragrammaton and all. So she, she gets into this, and it was, I mean, she's really just building this whole case up. And then she, I said, well, tell me a little bit about the covenants, how they were performed. Well, you know, they take an animal and they would cut it in half and they would divide the pieces. And then uh, she said uh, the, f- the most important thing about it, she said, of course, there's always blood involved in it. And then she said uh, when it was the oath was being taken or the covenant was being established, she said it was always done in the name of the greater party. And I said, really? She said, yeah. And I said, so what do you mean by that? She said, well, uh, example, she said, in your New Testament. She said, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about that God could not swear by any greater, so he swore by himself. And so she launches into that, and really, I'm telling you, it was really interesting. 
Now, let me remind you, she has no idea who I am or what I do. And I just listen. Wow, man, that's, now how does that, you know, and she'd launch into this. And, and, and I, I'm telling you, she probably went, I know, at least an hour. And finally, she stopped. She said, I am so sorry. She said, I have just dominated this conversation. She said, I've introduced myself to you. She said, what is your name? <laughs> My name is Mark. And Mark, what is it that you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a Christian pastor. She said, oh, now I know why you were asking so many questions. <clears throat> and I said, yeah. She said, well, she said, that's interesting. I said, yeah, she said, I, I, I teach a lot in Christian churches, actually. They have me come in, and she said, I go through some of these covenants and stuff. And she said, I really enjoy it. She said, I have a lot of friends that are Christians, and she said, they believe that Jesus is their Messiah. And I said, well, yes. And she said, and I said, you know, <clears throat> we really believe what you just said. I said, matter of fact, the people that I associate with, we preach and teach that covenant very strong. She said, and what covenant would that be? I said, well, you were talking about... <clears throat> How there has to be an animal, it has to be sacrificed, there has to be blood. Mm -hmm. And it's always done in the name of the greater party. She said, yes. I said, we teach that water baptism is a covenant. And I said, we believe that Jesus was the Lamb of God. We believe that his blood was shed. She said, well, I don't accept him as my Messiah. I said, I understand that, but... I said, you told me what you believe, and I'm going to tell you how I see what you believe through my lens. And so I proceeded to tell her, I said, and we believe it's done in the name <clears throat> of the greater party. There's nobody any greater than Jesus Christ. I said, because the scripture says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none of the name under heaven given among men, <clears throat> whereby we must be saved. So she said, I've never heard this before. Wow. And you're the professor. <laughs> and I said, we teach it very strong. We teach that you must be baptized in Jesus' name. She said, you don't baptize in the titles? I said, no. I said, we got something in common right there. I said, see, we don't believe in the Trinity. She said, and you're a Christian group? I said, yeah, we're a Christian group, believe it or not. But I said, we don't believe in the Trinity. We believe in one God. We believe that one God was manifest through the man, Christ Jesus. <clears throat> now, you don't accept him as your Messiah, but we do. And I said, we don't believe in a literal father, and we don't believe in the Holy Ghost, that there's three persons in the Trinity. And I said, when we baptize people, I said, according to Paul's writings, and when I'd say stuff like that, she'd kind of chuckle. I said, according to Paul's writings, I said, he taught us that circumcision... And the Old Testament, how it applies to us in the New Testament, is through water, I'm fixed to preach about it, just get ready, is through water baptism. And I said, so we believe that when we baptize somebody, that it's about a covenant being established. You are entering into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, amen. And your name is sure not any greater. That's why Paul said, I'm glad none of you were baptized in my name and all that but the name that you were baptized in is the name of the greater party. So when you were baptized, it was more than just you getting a little cleansing of some sort, ceremonial or something, and I believe in all of that. But the fact is, I think that we need a fresh revelation of what water baptism really is. <clears throat> Can I preach what I feel in the Holy Ghost tonight? Now, I, 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 I'm going to say a couple of things here, and, and just I think you know me by now. I don't have to qualify it. But we need to be very careful how fast we push people to the water. 
And if we're only pushing them to the water so we can tweet about it, you need to back up because you're pushing people to a covenant with God that they quite don't understand. And whether you do or don't understand it, God takes that covenant pretty serious. And I'm fixing to show you how serious he takes it. I'm for baptizing them by the thousands. Don't sit there and say, yeah, you know, it's an excuse. I'm not giving you an excuse for your laziness. Are you listening to me? I believe that we're going to baptize people. Brother Shatwell said, what would you do if you had 100 people to baptize? How long would it take you? I said, about five minutes. Somebody behind me said, why is that? I said, because we got the biggest baptistry you've ever seen. It's three miles from the church, but we got a big baptistry. <clears throat> it's called the Pacific Ocean. Amen. And I got a bunch of young guys that'd be glad to baptize them in the ocean. They're doing everything that's out there. Now, we, we really got into this discussion, and she gets to talk about this and all, and I said, uh, you know, we, we teach this very strongly. I'm telling you, she was interested by that. She said, I have never heard this explained like this, but she said it makes a lot of sense. If I believe that Jesus was the Messiah, this makes a lot of sense. And so we got to talking about the mikvah and stuff and the ceremonial bath and the cleansing of it and all that stuff and all. So it was just a really great conversation. But she said something in the conversation when she went to Hebrews chapter 6 that really caught my attention. I said, now explain to me the pieces again of the covenant. She said, well, when it was an oath and a covenant, they would take animals and they would cut them in half. And she said, and then the person that was responsible for the covenant and all that was making the oath would walk through those pieces. And he would say, or she would say, let it be done unto me even as unto these pieces if I do not keep this oath. <laughs> Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 34 if you do be so kind. I said, well, where can you find that in Scripture? She said, well, let's go to the Old Testament. And so here it is, the princes of Judah and the prince of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land, which passed between the parts of the calf. Who? Not 20. I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life and their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the fowls of the heaven and to the beasts of the earth. She said, you know what that means? So she said, Israel and these people had took an oath with God and they didn't keep it. And God said, you didn't keep your oath to me. And so I'm going to do exactly what you declared in this oath. I'm going to feed your flesh to the fowl of the air and to the beast of the field, and I'm going to do to you what was done to that calf because you ooh, didn't keep your covenant with me and keep your part in this oath. Selah. I said, whoa. I said, so God's pretty serious. He said, extremely. She said, he can't lie. He cannot lie. If he takes that oath that he swears by none greater, he cannot lie. So we stopped there, and I got off the plane. And then you know how you're kind of thinking about all this? And then, brother, the bell went off. I was like, oh, my God. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Because this is where Hebrews chapter 6, it shows what was taking place is in Genesis chapter 15. And here's 9 and 10. And he said unto him, take me and have for three years old. And she go to three years old. And a ram three years old. And the turtle dove. I'm getting so happy. <laughs> and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst. And laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. So God takes the animals except the birds. And he divides and tells Abraham, now divide these up and all. You got that? We all good? Let's go down to verse number 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. See, you didn't get it. You got it, you'd be shouting right now. 
You still ain't got it. I can tell some of you are like, you didn't get it. See, it wasn't Abraham walking through the pieces. It was God. And God, Brother Kenzie, was telling Abraham, Abraham, I just made a covenant and an oath to you that I'm going to give you all this land. And if I don't keep the word and keep my oath and covenant to you, let it be done unto me even as under these pieces. Now, God just said, Abraham, if I don't honor this oath and keep it, the whole universe is about to become divided. Because everything in the universe hangs and hinges on one fact. I cannot lie. And it's all held by the power of my word. And if I lie to you, Abraham, the sun's going to fall out of the sky and the ocean's going to invade inland. Because all of that is kept by the power of my word. <laughs> now let me ask you a question do you think you're really that special that you're the first person God ever lied to <clears throat> well I hate to tell you the sun's still in the sky and the ocean is still held to its boundaries by the word of God so as long as all that's going on, you know what that tells me? God didn't lie to you. God didn't lie to you. Stars are still where they're supposed to be. The moon's still in its position. The sun's still there. Animal kingdom doing all it was done. It's all by the word of God. He created it all by his word. And everything in the universe is still exactly where it's supposed to be. But you're sitting here tonight thinking that God didn't have anything else to do. So he made you a promise that he didn't intend on keeping. Mm, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Now, would you like to know a story? I'm going to preach now. I'm just getting warmed up. Now, here's the deal. You want a good story to match that? Some of you don't know if you do or not. <laughs> here's Abraham and Sarah. Brother Johnson, God tells them when they old. Past the time, well, the scripture says that Sarah was past the time of women, childbearing and all. And God says, Sarah, Abraham, y'all are going to have a baby. Hmm? You're going to have a baby. <laughs> Sarah's over there snickering. <laughs> Shall me and my Lord have pleasure in our old age? Oh, you're going to get more nervous than that, brother Dylan. I can tell you right now, you better take a vow to him right now. Here, let me help you out a little bit here. It's all going to be all right. Now, here's the deal. God makes them that prompt. Now, you know, this story really intriguing. Abraham's always trying to pass his wife off <laughs> as a sister. And I understand all the dynamic, but they're in Egypt. This king sees her. Man, I'd like to marry her. I'm going to take her. Hey, who? who that's, oh, that's my sister. So he takes her, he's going to marry her, and God speaks and says, let me tell you something. I've cursed everything in this land because of that woman right there. I suggest you leave her alone. She belongs to somebody else. Well, I, ooh. The guy that said, <laughs> she's my sister. And when he called him in, he said, well, I just... Didn't want you killing me and taking her. And so, so God had his own way. So he protects her. They come out. Mm. They come out. They go through some of these. And then finally, 
God says this to Abraham. He says, by this time next year, Sarah is going to have that child. Now, you got to remember that Sarah's getting pretty impatient. And she's, oh, Jesus. And she's looking around and she's seeing everybody around having the women having babies and having children. And she's past the time of childbearing. And she's got, when they come out of Egypt, they brought somebody out by the name of Hagar. And so Sarah comes up with this grand idea. Look, I just don't think I can produce this child. Take her. Now remember, through faith and patience. So it's very apparent. I want you to hear this. That they're getting impatient. So in their impatience, they revert to a work of the flesh. Let's just borrow this Egyptian. It's pretty apparent that she can produce children. She's not past the age of childbearing, so let's use her. Because it's apparent that there's something wrong here, and we're not going to be able to produce this child, so let's borrow the Egyptian to produce it. And they did. Ishmael's produced. But the one thing that I want to point out to you right now is, is that when, when Ishmael was conceived, Abraham had not been circumcised. Now remember that. They had been circumcised. So we know without fact that Ishmael could not be the son of promise. Because he's produced by an Egyptian and something that was not under circumcision yet. Produced by the flesh. Woo. So, Abraham, please, God, just accept Ishmael. Let him grow. Uh, he'll grow up be a great nation. But that's not him. You did that. You and Hagar did that one. It's not my child. That's not the promised child. That's not my seed. That's not it. Absolutely not. No. Then God makes the promise. This time next year, Sarah will have a child. Now, here goes Abraham. He goes to Gerar. And King Abimelech sees Sarah. She's over 90. You're getting there. You're getting there. She's over 90. And Abimelech says, whoa, that's a really pretty woman. I want to marry her. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> I'm just telling you, if you don't get some kind of revelation on that story, it looks like you're dealing with one twisted, <laughs> something wrong. Oh, come on. When you went looking for your wife, you didn't drive down to the local nursing home. <laughs> no, you didn't. Think I'd go find me a 90-year-old and marry her. Now, I'm not being disrespectful to age here, but it don't quite work out that way. So I mean, I'm just telling you right now, what's wrong with this king? He sees a 90-year-old woman and says, ooh, I, I want her. <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> no. Nah. But remember, God said before all this happens, by this time next year, Sarah's going to have a child. So you know what was going on? The only way that Sarah could have a child by this time next year is at least nine months out. God had to start restoring her youth. It's mm. the only thing I can figure out. 
I know all y'all are so spiritual. You don't even think this way, but I'm just telling you. Till Abraham waking up one morning. Sarah, girl. I don't know what you've been drinking. Whoa. You're looking better all the time. I mean, you're younger all the time, Sarah. I'm telling you, what in the world? What you been cooking in them lamb chops? I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Some of you are so holy out there. You're like, I bet you kiss in the King James Version, don't you? That's what I thought. And hey, they're going to get y'all spiritual. I'm going to take you the other way here tonight. <laughs> now, I... God speaks to Abimelech and says, if you touch her, you're a dead man. I'll kill you before you touch her. Now, I want you to listen. It's apparent that Abraham didn't have any problems producing a child. So the problem must have been with Sarah. That's what everybody believed. The problem's with Sarah. What's wrong with Sarah? She couldn't have any kids. And Abraham's going around talking about all this stuff. I mean, he changed his name over something this God spoke to him about he'd be the father of many nations or sons. Sarah hasn't produced him one child. And then Sarah gets to looking around, seeing all these women producing children, and she gets to thinking, must be something wrong with me. There's got to be something wrong with me. There's got to be something wrong with me. The problem's got to be with me. I find it amazing that God would let Abraham go sleep with Hagar and not kill Hagar. Mm. But Sarah is a different story. So to me, it's kind of like this, where the ministry can go sleep with whatever, whoever. And you can produce whatever you want to produce in the flesh. And out of your impatience... Because you get to looking around and you're looking at the church saying, must be something wrong with the church. Must be something wrong with the apostolics. Must be something wrong with the oneness people. I mean, look out there, all the Egyptians and everybody's having babies and everybody in the camp is producing. I mean, brother, they're having kids like crazy. So there's got to be something wrong with Sarah. Must be something wrong with you apostolic people. You keep talking about this promise and this revival and all. Why don't you look around about you and see what everybody else is producing? They're producing numbers after numbers after numbers, and you people keep sitting around talking about this promise God made you. And we got some people that have grown impatient, and so they decided... Let's just go try some fleshly methods to produce this revival. I told you I'm going to preach to you tonight. Let's just go borrow some Egyptian methods and some fleshly things and let's see if we'll even let God accept it. <clears throat> now listen, please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, but I, I'm going to tell you something. You can try to dress it up. You can try to put the light show on. You can try to do all this stuff and all. But can I just be honest with you? It's fleshly. It, it, it's fleshly. I was in a, you, I, 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 this is going to go over like a flock of dogs. But I left a youth service here a while back, and when I was on my way out, a man visiting was there, and I asked him, so what did you think? He said, oh, man, it's great. It's like being in a club. I said, what? He said, yeah, I just like being in a club. Lights going on. It's all dark. Everything's going. <laughs> Testing one, two. <laughs> you really think that's going to produce an apostolic revival? Do you really think 
I know I'm going to be popular after this one, but do you really think just getting you some fleshly stuff and trying to get God to accept it? Well, God will accept it. I know it's produced by flesh, but God will accept it after all. Something wrong with Sarah, something wrong with the way we do it. If we were really doing it right, we'd be producing kids. And, I mean, Sarah, she's really producing them, and, and Abraham... So what in the world's wrong with Sarah? All that old-fashioned stuff, praying and fasting and teaching Bible studies and talking to people, all that stuff, it's old-fashioned and it's outdated and it won't work. There's something wrong with Sarah. But I've come tonight to tell you that's a lie. I want to declare to you right now, there's nothing wrong with Sarah. I'm going to say it again. Nothing wrong with Sarah. I said there's nothing wrong with Sarah. And at the set time, God visited Sarah. You missed it. And at the set time, God visited Sarah. Nothing wrong with Sarah. We just don't understand God's timing. I said, there's nothing wrong with the apostolic church. It's all about God's timing. I don't know about that. Well, how about this one? And when the fullness of time came. Now, you see, you, you have a problem with time because you're creatures of time. I was telling Brother Scott, now, you know this. It's just old stuff. But, you know, our problem is, is we, we live in time and what we're producing is in time. God is eternal. So that means time is just a little segment that he inserts into eternity. Hmm. Best way for me to explain it to you is this. It's like taking a shot, a picture, doosh. And that picture is a picture of when time starts and when time ends and everything in between. And God's holding it. Looking at it. He sees the beginning and he sees the end because as eternal, he is before time and he's after time. So you have a hard time with that because you're not there yet. And so God just looks at it all and when God speaks to you about a promise, he's speaking where he's looking at the finished product and he sees it over here. And then he comes back over here in the time and he says, I need to tell you about something. Sarah, you're going to have a baby. I'm standing over here where you're rocking it. And I think I'll drop a bomb on you right now. See, God had to restore Sarah's youthfulness back to her for her to take care of that child. And so if you think for one minute that your church is going to have this apostolic revival with spiritual old age, the only churches and people that's going to have this revival are people that will allow the Holy Ghost to restore back to them the youthfulness of that Book of Acts church to where we can handle and produce what God wants us to handle and produce. Not being disrespectful, but if you're on a cane spiritually and your church is and you're expecting to handle a new baby and a two-year-old running around, you need brain surgery. That don't mix. And God's not going to give that baby to something that cannot produce it and something that cannot take care of it. So when Brother Shatwell gets to talking about the stuff he did today, that's just God saying, I've got to get you back to your youthfulness. I've got to get you back to being excited. I've got to get you back to the book of Acts atmosphere. I want to restore unto you the joy of your salvation. I need... Come on, somebody. You really think that people want what you got when you're sitting there all down and mad at God and frustrated and 
right now. You need the Holy Ghost to restore something back to you where you say it with sincerity. Hey, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. But I'm excited about living for God. Let me hurry. Let me hurry. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Yeah. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. This revival is going to happen. And what you prophesied today is going to happen. It's not a matter of you really think it will. Trust me. When God spoke to David Shatwell yesterday, this morning, God was standing over here where everything he was talking about, it was happening. And he projected backwards into time and said, hey, I need to tell you, I got a promise for you over here. And let me help you with something. You ready? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And you need to decide if you're going to be there. You need to decide, Sarah, if you're going to let the Holy Ghost restore your youth. Sarah, you have to decide if you'll become impregnated. You can't keep your distance and say, no, 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 no. I, that's crazy. That's just too far-fetched. No. Oh, no, just, just let the world produce it. Just let some of these other people produce it. Just let Hagar produce it. I, let me help you with something. They are not the people of covenant. Are you listening? They are not covenant people. And if you think that God's going to use something outside the covenant of water baptism... Are you listening to me? My God, you're Jesus' name, people. That's more than just something for you to shout about at camp meeting. You are people of covenant. I said you are people of covenant. You are one God, Jesus' name, tongue-talking people of covenant. You believe in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. I just... I just I just don't think we ought to treat the Egyptians right. I didn't say treat them rough. I didn't say be mean. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm advocating here tonight is, see, you keep looking over here saying, man, if we just had what they had, and if we just... And God's like, what? 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 I didn't make a covenant with them. They didn't take on the greatest name there is. In case you haven't figured it out yet, this whole end time Gentile revival is about the revelation of the mighty God in Christ and water baptism in Jesus' name. And they're going to come. I feel a prophetic something coming on me right now. They're going to come. They're going to come by the thousands. I said they're coming by the thousands. You heard it talked about today. You may not get to baptize all of them, but baptize the pastor and let him go back and baptize his entire congregation. But if they never come under the UPC banner, big deal. It's going to happen. I said, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Now's not the time for covenant people to try to use an Egyptian or figure some other method. It's time for us to be patient and wait on the work of the Holy Ghost. Because I'm telling you, whatever God does in this end time, he's going to do it through his covenant people. You're rethinking water baptism. You need brain surgery. 
Now's not the time to back up when it's too intimidating and too forceful. I got news for you. What must I do to be safe? It's real easy. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the covenant. That's the covenant. That makes you a part of the seed of Abraham. Your baptism placed you into Christ, and Christ is the seed of Abraham. And the only way to become the seed of Abraham is to be baptized into Christ. Woo. For as many as have been buried with him have put Christ on. You know what you said today? Have put Christ on. It's not time to back up all this. The world's coming. The religious world's coming. Don't you listen to me. Because this is the part you're not going to shout about. If everything happens like you said today, and this revival takes place, and it starts sweeping through denominational churches, get ready. Because that's where your persecution is going to come from. Because it's all about the coffers, and it's all about the dollars. And when they're watching their people leave with their checkbooks, Up there and look at me like that if you want, but it's true. Trust me, they're not going to sit idly by. All persecution is stemmed from the religious sector. And brother, when they start seeing what the Holy Ghost is doing, they're going to try to put it out. And they're going to try to stop it. But Abraham, I said I'd be a shield before you. <laughs> Abraham, I said I'd protect you. Abraham, I said I'd give you the land. Listen, give me... Listen, I don't think you get this or not. No, yeah, you do. I'm sorry. You get it. You get it. Well, what's the big deal between the Muslims and the Jews right now? The big deal? The big deal is the Muslims are trying to prove that God lied. That's how simple that is. God didn't give that land to their seed. He said, I get not to the not to the offspring of the Egyptian. I give my seed to Sarah and her offspring. Paul taught you that in the book of Galatians. And that battle right now, some of you are this is no big deal. It is a big deal. They've been trying to take back the covenant that God made with Israel. It's about that land. You better get it right. Because in that covenant, God said, see up there, see back there, see over there. That's yours. This covenant that I swore to you that I cannot lie, that's your land. That's your land. And trust me, if they're still fighting over it, the enemy's trying to take your land. And he's trying to take your promise. But you need to look the spirit of fear in the eye and let it know. You're not taking my land and you're not taking my covenant. My God did not lie. He said, wherever I put the soles of my feet, I'm going to give it to you. So I'm ready to walk the promises of God. God, I'm closing. God Jesus. takes his promises pretty serious. Yeah, he does. Spirit of fear grips Timothy, trying to strip him of the promises of God. And Paul writes to him and says, Timothy, God didn't give you that spirit of fear. Spirit of love, power, sound mind. And oh, by the way, Timothy, concerning those prophecies, them promises that went before on thee, you need to remember them. That thou by them mightest war a good warfare. And the enemy wants you to forget them. 
and he wants you to push them back and forget them because how long has it been? Well, you know, I thought when God made me that promise within a few hours it would happen. <laughs> no, not quite that way. Through faith and patience, he endured, having obtained the promises. You see, we've been walking by faith and patience and enduring, and the enemy's coming after your promise. Why did you go to that city? Did you have a promise or not? What did you go on? Boy, it got quiet in here all of a sudden. I'm going to tell you something. If you don't have a promise and you went, you're a sitting duck. Because when the enemy comes, you're going to need something to war against him. And the thing you're going to war against him with is a strong consolation. God didn't lie to me when he made that promise to me. God didn't lie to me. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care if I don't even see it in my generation. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but God having provided some better thing. Brother, they may have died in this life not thinking they had seen the city, but trust me, when they open their eyes on the next side, whew, quite a city. Trying to challenge some of you right now. The enemy's after the word of God in your life. He's after your promise. Just, just, just use this and you can have it. Can't do that. Can't do that. I tell you, God, when he makes a promise, well, for some reason, I feel to tell this story. I don't know why. God, I was in revival with Kima when I was pastoring in Oklahoma. And uh, we were having one of our chainsaw massacres. He's over there trying to love me. I just start the chainsaw up, cutting everything I could find to cut up. <laughs> and I was in the Old Mogi Sanctuary one day, praying, seeking the Lord. And God spoke something to me. And it was so far out there. I'm telling you, it was. And the battle was, that's what you said, the unbelief was, me? You're going to use me to do that? Now, he didn't owe it to me. God didn't owe it to me. But it was so far out there. I said, God, I just, two things, two things after that promise. Number one, you remember in that day that Moses was not in the court of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was in my court. When Moses went before Pharaoh, he was not standing in Pharaoh's court. Moses had brought Pharaoh into God's court. Still so far out there. Just so far out there. I'm standing in Oak Mogi, Oklahoma. The son of a sharecropper. My dad come out of the cotton fields of southeast Missouri. Dad dropped out of school when he was in the eighth grade. He was forced to do it because my grandpa was hurt in a train wreck and couldn't finish the crops. So dad dropped out of school to work in the field so he'd have something to eat. I'm standing in Oak Mogi, little building, and the promise was so. Is 
that's what you're wrestling with right now. The promise seems so far beyond your abilities. And Kate, of course it does. It has to. I said, God, man, I'm trying to believe you. He said, okay. I'm going to bear witness to prove to you that this is from me. I will visit this area not many days hence with massive death and destruction. Mm. So I went to church that night, preached at Okima, toward the end of the service, I told him, I said, Tony Brown was there, and I told him, I said, right in front of your Bible, date it and sign it, and I'll, I'll uh, date it and I'll sign it. God will visit. And so little did I know that within 12 hours of that prophecy, Timothy McVeigh would back that van up to the Murray Federal Building in Oklahoma City, 40-something miles away, and sent 150-something people to eternity, 168 days. When the news went off and I got the report, it was like the Lord said, I told you. And I'm telling some of you in this place tonight, the enemy is after your promise. He's trying to make you look through your own humanity and limitations. And the enemy is telling you now it's too far. The season's passed. Sarah, you should have had the child when it was possible, but the season has passed. You missed it, Sarah. Your time has come and gone. Woo! No. It's all about God's timing. I can't let go of that promise. It hasn't happened yet. But Brother Shatwell, when you were preaching today, I felt that reverberating in my spirit. I told you, I'm setting the stage for this to happen. Prepare yourself and get ready because I'm going to do exactly like I told you. I cannot lie. And I'm telling somebody in this building tonight, I don't care how far out there it is. I don't care how many people have looked at you and scoffed and laughed and said, how can this be? You're past the time of childbearing. Something in your spirit tonight ought to leap. Because God is going to visit a dead womb. I'm preaching to some of you right now. You need to reach out and grab that promise that God made you and hold on to it with everything that's within you and tell the devil it's going to come to pass. 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 My time, I'm telling somebody the fullness of time is moving really quickly towards you right now. Matter of fact, while some of you are standing in this building worshiping and praising God, the wheels are already going into motion. The whole end time drama is starting to unfold and you're a key component to it and you're a key player in it. Are you listening to me? This service is much bigger than just a few home missionaries here. Something is happening in the Holy Ghost right now and it's all about God's timing. 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 Are you listening to me? I feel the witness of the Holy Ghost right now. God's time. If God promised you he's going to heal you, you ought to be grabbing a hold of it right now. If God said he's going to deliver you, you ought to be grabbing a hold of that promise right now. This could be my time. This moment could be the time. The fullness of time may be here. God said he's going to make provision. I don't even have to wait to get home to see it or that, for it to happen. God said it was going to... Somebody ought to rejoice right now. I'm a person of covenant. I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I am the seed of Abraham. I represent God's covenant people in my city. Every promise that God made to Abraham, I am a recipient. Oh, boy.
Who do you think you are? Something wrong with you people. Listen, listen. We can't miss a time of visitation. We all believe in the visitation, but we can't miss the time of visitation. Now, don't you listen to me? I feel very, very strong. As a matter of fact, some pieces are connecting right now. In May, Brother Ellis had come to the district to present Purpose Institute, and then he stayed over and preached for me. I'm not that familiar with Ellis. I know we've known each other. but So in the pulpit that night, he told our congregation, he said, I feel to tell you something. But just remain standing in there. I feel to tell you something. That in the next year, Brother Morgan, you and this church need to be very careful about any decision you make. Because there's something major going to happen in the Holy Ghost. And it is all determined by your decisions. Be very cautious. And when he said it to the Holy Ghost, and that's, that's the way I sense it. It's such a witness of the Holy Ghost. And so I said, okay. And then I was Alabama camp meeting in June. And I stand on the platform when the Lord spoke. That statement to me, and I talked to Dave and said, and I said, it's on the platform that night, and the Lord said, so what's wrong with Sarah? So when I got back to the room, God began to talk to me as I sat in there looking at the story. I probably read that story 15, 20 times that night, just looking at it every way. And when I sat in there, the Lord said, within one year, Something major is going to happen. You need to prepare. The church needs to prepare. Something's getting ready to happen. So I stand here tonight telling all of us, our decisions need to be very cautious. We are the people of covenant. We need to be very cautious because the Holy Ghost is trying to move this thing with us. The windows of heaven are going to open and things that you felt have been withheld from you are going to start flowing and moving. And as one preacher said today, you need to make sure your house is in order. I feel to say it in the Holy Ghost tonight. Set your house in order. Something is coming. I want to say it again in the Holy Ghost. Set your house in order. Something's coming. Let me tell you where we're at right now. Listen. Listen, let me tell you where we're at in the Holy Ghost right now. We are exactly where Jesus talked about that woman kept coming, the unjust judge and all. And then we think he changed subjects when he says, but nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Oh, he's talking about the rapture when he comes back with it. No, 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 he's not. He's talking about the same thing. You know what he's actually saying? That when I finally do arrive with the promise, will you have faith to receive it? Because you can be in the asking position for so long and it looks like God's not doing it, God's not doing it, God's not doing it, that when he finally decides to do it, 
you don't even have enough faith to transition yourself from asking to receiving. Because you're so beat down by the long suffering of God and God's patience and you just keep praying and you think that God's not answering your prayer. It's not that God's not answering your prayer. You haven't perceived the timing of it. And so you think God's delay is, is, is God just telling you no. I don't know if I believe that or not. Well, why don't you go resurrect Rhoda and ask her? The knock's at the door and they're in a prayer meeting. She went to the door while everybody else is still praying. Who's there? Simon Peter. Can I come in? Hang on, I'll be right back. She goes back into the prayer meeting and starts telling everybody in there, hey, folks, get up. Simon Peter's out there knocking at the door. No, he's not. Rhoda, get down here and pray. Read the story. Read the story. Let me tell you why they were having trouble believing. Because they had prayed for James to be released. He got his head cut off. So they were already allowing the past and things that God didn't do the way they thought he ought to. They were letting it determine and regulate what God was presently trying to do. And because you're looking around at everybody producing and you haven't, you feel this pressure on you. So you're just going to do whatever you got to do to produce. She said, I'll be right back. She goes back in there and said, hey, is it really you? Yes, yeah, me. He went back in there. I go, Rhoda, thou art mad. It's his ghost. The Jews taught in four days a man's spirit wandered the earth. So they, what they had just told her was, Simon Peter's already dead, and his ghost or his spirit's come to visit us. They were accepting defeat, and God was saying, it's all about timing. It's all about timing. And my time is now. I got your miracle knocking at the door. Now can you get up and go get it? Can you quit that begging and go get it? Can you quit that pleading and go get it? No, I got one better than that. Can you quit feeling sorry for yourself that you're a one God, Jesus' name, holding this person, and nobody wants it, nobody, oh, give me a break. You need to get up from that pity party of yours, go over to the door of faith and swing it wide open and tell the promise of God, come on in, I've been waiting for you. I challenge you to do it right now in the, in the spirit. Go open the door. You don't know what I've been through. Oh, come on, we all been through stuff. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. You heard the promise of God today. Now, can you open the door of your heart and receive it right now? Don't beg him and don't plead for it. Rejoice. Thank him for it. Praise him for it. Shout the victory. God's healing you right now. God's delivering you. I've been prayed for so many times. I don't care how many times you've been prayed for. Open the door of your faith and let the mi- Time out. Time out. This one's going to sting. Let me tell you why Brother Stone King's not here tonight. Because, see, you come expecting him to do it. I'll say it again. You come expecting him to do it. And God said, not him. I need you. I lost a bunch of you right there. I'm going to use you tonight. See, if he had have done it, you'd have stood there and watched him do it. But I'm going to need you to do it tonight. Because what I've been using him in, I want to start using you in. He was just somebody that broke through to show you what you could have. Well, you, you locked up on me right there. I said, you locked up right there in the Holy Ghost. You already heard where your unbelief is. It's not the power of God. It's in whether or not God can do it through you. And tonight... Tonight, the promise is knocking at the door. God wants to use your hands. God wants to use your voice. God wants to use your faith. 
I don't have that kind of faith. We'll borrow some of his and pray right now. Let the gift of faith come on me right now, Holy Ghost. I ask the gift of faith to come to this building right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Woo! Now you're going to lay hands on each other and God's going to heal and God's going to deliver and God's going to speak through you. I'm just a home missionary. I quit saying that. You're not just a home missionary. You are the seed of Abraham. You're a covenant person. When you took on that name, you got a right to use it. Now lay hands on somebody and pray with the gift of faith operating through you right now. Miracles are in this building right now. Not only the gift of faith, but the working of miracles right now. Let it be released in the name of Jesus Christ. Be healed in the name. There you go. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name. No, don't let somebody else do it for you. He wants to use you. Oh, I pray for people, nothing happened. He wants to use you. The timing is, there it is. There it is. The timing is now. What God's using you in right now, you're going to go home and it's going to operate. Let it flow. That's it, let it flow. That's it, let it flow. There's a door of utterance open to you right now. Speak it. I said speak it. Speak to that mountain. Open your mouth and say it. The Holy Ghost will tell you, say it. Say it. In the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, be delivered. In the name of Jesus, be set free. In the name of Jesus, let the Jehovah Jireh come and be the Lord. That's it. That's it. That's it. You are a covenant person. You have a right.
somebody prophesy. 